Canada is testing sinister wokeness to its destruction, according to columnist and author Zoe Strimple. She writes in a new op-ed for The Telegraph, quote, Canada has gone from being a lesson in enviable dullness and relative common sense to a warning of what happens when you let politicians opportunistically drunk on the Kool-Aid of identity politics run the show. Zoe, Zoe joins us now to expand on her point. Welcome to Rising. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, so what kind of policies do you have in mind? You know, wokeness is sometimes a vague concept when you say that uh, Canada is following them to the point of destruction. I think the, the problem with wokeness is what it kind of suggests is, um, let's say, not in the best health underneath. So there's no coherent uh, single thing that I could say, you know, this is what Canada needs to do or any country. But I don't think people that are um, using identity politics to structure their policies uh, have any kind of coherent or cohesive idea of what they believe a country should be um, and what kinds of sort of theory of society they actually have either. I think it's an inherently fractured um, and, and sort of fracturing set of like, I don't know, sensibilities. Um, so I, I mean, I think one of the big debates going on right here in Britain that I think is um, underpinning a lot of the discontents we have, which in some ways mirror some of those arguments I was making about Canada, is um, a very huge discomfort with history and where we sit in relation to the past and how we should be thinking about the past in relation to where we are now. So I think some of, you know, digging into the kind of last few years of the Canadian discourse around um, you know, for instance, the the unmarked graves in the in the residential schools and things like that. It's not that those aren't terrible things, but it's that the way that these are being kind of brought into public discourse suggests that Canada is a piece of crap. It's just genocidal. It's just racist. You know, it's all these things. And a lot of countries in the West are kind of going through those same motions. And I think it's actually, it, it, that's not a strong position to be coming from. So that's more where I'm coming from rather than like individual um, policies. Although one could easily, you know, drill down into things to do with how you should deal with drug addiction. I'm not sure I'm kind of the expert on that, but you know, there obviously are specific things going on which are, which are potentially disturbing. And so, wait, I'm sorry, Zoe, uh, let's stick with this point because it's such an interesting one. There is this, conflict that has emerged around how to talk about history, where one side is saying, we've never talked about these issues for the hundreds of years of our country's history. Now they're finally being raised, things like the residential schools, like just tr 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 horrific, tragic um, uh, behavior toward indigenous populations, et cetera. Now that they're being talked about for the first time, and I think with the gravity that the tragedy warrants, there is another group of people that says, well, this is being painted as a condemnation of Canada as a country as a whole. And I think for some people who really see the value in talking about all aspects of a country's history, it's difficult to ascertain sometimes what is the right way to talk about horrific events? What is the appropriate way that the, the critics would say we can talk about these events that doesn't amount to simply burying everything back under the rug and not talking about them again. Because of course, when bad things happen historically, it's going to affect, negatively affect people's views of a nation, at least at that time in the nation's history. So if the if the standard is, we can't talk about anything that makes anybody think negatively about a nation, well, you can see how that would lead to a really inaccurate, misleading portrait of what a country's history really was. Sure, I mean, it is without, a single shadow of a doubt what every free nation of any description should be doing, which is being extremely critical of all aspects of its society and its history. However, I think there's a difference between um, taking a serious lens to a country's history, which includes in every single country's case, things that we would consider unspeakably immoral and terrible now, and using the kinds of language that puts Canada in the same category as Nazi Germany. So when you start getting s terminology like genocide, which is thrown around, I think you then start to think, okay, well, we need to come up with a completely different way to think about these things because this is all, um, this isn't achieving a nuanced or even a, a sort of appropriately condemnatory uh, view of things that deserve that condemn condemnation. This is 
uh, actually kind of occluding or hiding or concealing the kinds of discussion we should be having because because it's being lumped in with the very work, you know, it, it's making Canada no different from, or the UK no different from, for instance, Germany or fascist Europe well, in the is, 1930s. Isn't there I, think, a difference? I think there is a problem with that. I mean, and, and are, just, well, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think that what we've got ourselves into a problem, which is that the people who would say we've gone too far on condemning our, these countries, in, you know, this rhetoric of a binary, like all good, all bad, I think they would say, unfortunately, identity politics and the kind of, let's say, um, critical race theoretical way of looking at history has brought this new polarizing way of talking about history on us all. So they would say, well, we don't want to talk about history in this simplistic way either. We don't want to in any way hide the sins of the past, but we're being forced up against a wall to defend or condemn by, you know, they started it with like these sorts of very totalizing narratives about, about our countries. So I, I would agree that comparisons are odious comparison to the Holocaust in particular often are done to to weaponize that tragedy in a way that is not particularly clarifying or useful. However, a term like genocide has a definition, right? It's the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or ethnic group. And to the extent that what happened in Canada with the indigenous population, as in America with our indigenous population, where it looks like just a quick Google about, you know, um, uh, half the population of Native Americans in Canada between 1800 and 1900 uh, were killed, that that seems like it fits the definition. So are you are you objecting to the use of the word genocide because of Holocaust analogies or because you actually think that what happened in Canada doesn't rise to the definition of what a genocide is? Well, I mean, I'm not going to uh, I would not want to now assert myself as an authority on definitions of genocide if large numbers of any population are murdered, whether through ethnic cleansing or not, and it meets the definition of genocide, it meets the definition of genocide. All I mean, I just was aware that people who actually either were hol Holocaust survivors or had witnessed genocides in Ru the genocides in Rwanda um, were finding that these particular types of you know, words and language were inappropriate for the Canadian um, for the Canadian situation. But I think what they were objecting to and what I would object to is not so much saying, oh, it's fine, you know, all of those, you know, killing half of the of a population of indigenous people is somehow not genocide. I think there were some, there was people saying, or there was one uh, journalist in particular, I think who had a prominent uh, quote saying that Canada is participating in ongoing genocide. And I think that is the kind of language that was upsetting people, and I think rightly so. So, I think that I think what we're dealing with here, and you're right to kind of you know quiz me on this because I think this is something that all you know Britain is is grappling with as well, and certainly the U.S. What should the relationship be between an honest discussion of our past and the way we proceed and think about ourselves in the present? Should we be now undermining or scorning or looking askance on all the good things about um, Western liberal democracy, you know, democratic societies because pa our pasts include? you know, unspeakable things, which, of course, point to countries that didn't participate in unspeakable things. So then there's that question of, well, how far does that get us? You know, everyone was, you know, the things that were utterly the norm 200 years ago, utterly the norm, no one didn't participate in them. How much is that useful to continually say we are worthless pieces of, you know, SHIT now? Well, they, Do we have sorry, anything to defend? Um, can we Can we think about, you know, are, should we? We've got global threats from China, from Russia. What are we defending? You know, is there something to defend in, in Western liberal democracies, or should we? You know, is having a robust discussion about the past part of what it is to be that? But is it? Is it perhaps? And this is what I worry about: seeping into the, you know, a kind of way of undermining everything about the present in these countries that's actually really, really important and worth defending. So I think it's about that. How do you keep separate past and present or how should you, if at all? And people well, have different views on this. One of the things, shifting gears a little bit before we have to let you go, unfortunately, uh, one of the things that Canada's current government has attracted a lot of scrutiny for 
is this uh, the pro the trucker protest the perception that um, you know, the liberal healthy dissent and free speech and all that was being thrown out the window when it came to these protests and some other things um, you know can you speak to to that concern I don't know if it's right to call it wokeness necessarily but um, it's uh, something that many people say is contrary to the spirit of kind of Western liberalism and democracy well, I think, so I, I am completely out of step with all of my um, peers on anything to do with COVID, which is that I basically understand being stringent. I, you know, I, I think if you have a vaccine mandate, you have a vaccine mandate. I mean, I, I, I to me, the, like, this is, this is actually a bit of a side uh, thing that I don't think is, is, is what I would to be con considered to be part of wokeness. You know, I'm, I mean, even that word, I mean, how sick of it are we all? I mean, but I would, that's not for me interesting or part of this picture, actually. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of things have been hijacked, uh, you know, like the trucker, th you know, okay, it was a big deal. But to me, that's the sort of problem of like elitist, you know, imposing of this sort of hypocrisy, you know, hypocrisy and, you know, doing down the working man for this kind of shady, sinister, uh, like agenda. Um, I that that wasn't that's not really relevant for me. I think what's important is about, you know, things like should, you know, misgendering, is that really a crime? You know, starting to turn things that should, that are just like right into wrong, wrong into right, up into down, like just kind of like trying to kind of destroy all that we know as like literally as a paradigm or to use a really pretentious word, epistemology um, about what is right, what is wrong, you know, the world as we understand it. I don't think the extreme case of what, pe what governments chose to do in COVID is necessarily part of that. So I can ask you quickly um, before we wrap, is Canada, has Canada made moves to criminalize misgender, uh, misgendering people? Sorry? Has, there, has, there, has there been legislation in Canada to criminalize misgendering yeah, there, uh, people? There has, uh, it, the, yeah. the, the human rights um, provision law, correct? Yeah, and, and remember there was a whole thing about Jordan Peterson doing it and, uh, and there was a long ruling about it. Um, to Is do it with, an effect? Um, yes. Yeah. So what are the, what so, kind of criminal penalties exist for misgendering people? I don't know. Do you know that, Robbie? Just curious. I mean, is it like can, jail? Can you go to jail for it, or is it like a? I, I think. You I mean, either fine. way, it's you not get a fine good. But you get hauled before a committee, and you maybe lose your position as a professor. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting area of inquiry. We will have to have you back uh, and talk more about it, Zoe. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thanks. We'll have more rising for you right after this.